Welcome back to the report. Yesterday, pharmaceuticals entrepreneur Martin Shakili was arrested on fraud charges. Reporter Yasmin Katoon has this story and the rest of today's news. Pharmaceutical entrepreneur Martin Shkreli, who caused public outroar after he drastically raised the price of a life-saving prescription drug, was arrested yesterday on fraud charges. Prosecutors said he ran a Ponzi-like scheme at his former hedge fund and pharmaceutical company. Shkreli, who is currently chief executive officer of two pharmaceutical companies, was charged in a federal indictment filed in Brooklyn relating to his management of hedge fund MSMB Capital Management and biopharmaceutical company Retrofin Inc. He has been charged with securities fraud, securities fraud conspiracy and wire fraud conspiracy. The maximum sentence for the top count is 20 years in prison. An associate was also arrested on Thursday. Both men entered pleas of not guilty through their lawyers. The World Bank and Iraq have signed an agreement for an £800 million loan to help offset the fall in oil prices and security costs associated with the fight against the Islamic State group. Iraq's ambassador to the United States, Lukman Faili, penned the agreement at the World Bank headquarters in Washington, D.C., alongside the bank's Iraq country director, Farid Belhaj. Iraq's state finances are heavily dependent on oil revenues, which have sunk as oil prices have plunged. The aim of the emergency loan was to help rebuild and return basic services for citizens. Belhaj said Iraq had committed to undertake economic reforms to fix structural distortions that had dragged on its economy even before the current crisis. The UN Security Council has unanimously adopted a resolution to cut off funds for the Islamic State group in a firmer move by the international community. Measures such as asset freeze, travel ban and arms embargo will be taken against Islamic State who continues to hold large swathes of Syria and Iraq, including oil and gas fields. The resolution was adopted by the 15-nation UN body at an open meeting chaired by the US Treasury Secretary, who currently holds a rotating council presidency for December. The resolution also noted that IS is a splinter group of al-Qaeda and said that terrorism can only be defeated by a sustained and comprehensive approach involving the active participation and collaboration of all states and international regional organizations to impede, impair and incapacitate the terrorist threat. Speaking today, Prime Minister David Cameron has said he could see a pathway to a deal to keep Britain in the European Union after EU leaders told him at a summit in Brussels they would not accept discrimination against EU migrant workers in the UK. In his longest address in more than five years of attending EU summits, the Conservative leader told the 27 other national leaders over dinner that if they wanted to keep Britain in, they must address his voters' concerns about curbing immigration. There's a pathway through this to a deal in February. It's going to take a lot of hard work, but what I sense tonight in the room, that there's a lot of goodwill, there is momentum, People want a deal that keeps Britain, uh, keeps Britain in the European Union by giving us that opportunity in our referendum. But a lot has got to be done between now and then. But in the end, find solutions and solutions as the European Union itself. EU officials said Cameron began his pitch after well, European no, Council President Donald Tusk the told the summit there was good progress on three of London's four key demands. But the fourth, to deny EU migrants in work benefits for four years, solutions. was very it's difficult. But I'm involved. Well, joining me to discuss all that is Conservative MP Daniel Hannan and Natalie Bennett, who's leader of the Green Party. Welcome to the programme, both of you. Now, Daniel, I mean, uh, we saw the clip there of the royal crest falling uh, wonky on the uh, podium. Is that the most substantive thing that's happened in these discussions? Yeah, it was rather symbolic, really, wasn't it, as the PM was telling us what a great deal it was. I mean, never mind what people like me were after, more economic freedom, more sovereignty. The PM has failed all of his own stated tests. He was talking about repatriating social and employment policy, about curbing the European court, uh, about opting out of criminal justice policy. Uh, all of that has been dropped. And what we're left with is a kind of staged row, a hacker, if you like, of synthesized aggression. Uh, the deal, such as it was, was done right at the beginning because there was no change necessary. But they needed to stage a row. And so we have this charade of Britain pretending to ask for things the EU pretending to consider them, and some table banging when all that's really being demanded is the status quo. Mm. I mean, Natalie, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get into some disagreement between the two of you, but um, 
You must see this set of negotiations in pretty much that light. It was a bit of theatre staged to um, hopefully appease people like Daniel in the Tory party. It doesn't sound as if it's working for him. Um, should we be sceptical of the outcome of this? Well, I think we can certainly agree. We can agree on the fact that David Cameron made no real progress. Um, I would celebrate that fact. I think if you look at particularly one of the issues that's uh, clearest and easiest to understand, the idea that um, people who are here, migrants from across the EU working in Britain, that they should not get the same in-work benefits as, as a British citizen working beside them, you know, doing the same job. We think about the situation of their children. You know, it's clearly unfair, discriminatory, unreasonable. And you know, I'm very glad that the EU leaders told David Cameron to go away. And in terms of the other changes that David Cameron wants, you know, some of the areas around increased democracy I don't necessarily disagree with. But what's very clear is David Cameron wants an EU that works for the city, that works for the financial sector, that really doesn't work for workers, for ordinary people. And that's the kind of EU that the Green Party wants, a social Europe, a Europe where we have a foundation of standards. And Natalie, may I pick you up on the, on the migration point? Because, of course, there is still institutionalised discrimination. It's now against people who come from outside the EU. Britain is a global country. We're connected to every continent. We're now celebrating the centenary of the First World War when we were helped by people from every corner of the world, uh, 400,000 Muslims just from British India. And now the relatives of those volunteers, and they were all volunteers, there was no enlistment, find that they can't bring auntie over for a wedding because we've cracked down so severely on visas for non-EU nationals in order to free up unlimited space for people who may have zero connection to the UK. Now, surely it's got to be, I'm not saying that there should be unlimited migration for the Commonwealth, but surely that we should end this institutional discrimination against them in favour of people who happen to hold EU passports. Well, I would entirely agree with you that we have huge problems with our immigration policy, which comes from the government's artificial, failed idea of an immigration cap. And we have huge problems in terms of uh, Britons who can't live in their own country with their spouse or partners, our family migration rules. As you rightly identify, people who aren't able to bring over older relatives to live with them. Or even, 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 even in terms of visiting, as I was about to say before I was interrupted, um, even allowing them to, to come and visit. Uh, but, you know, what the reason why we have the rules in the EU is because free movement of the EU applies to UK citizens as well. We have a situation where it's a huge benefit to people in Britain. They have the opportunity perhaps to get an Erasmus scholarship and go and study in Rome for a year, go and be an au pair in, in Paris and brush up on your French, or indeed the, the enrichment that comes from all those EU citizens coming there here. So that's, you know, I would agree with you that we shouldn't be you know, having the kind of really tight, unreasonable immigration rules we have for, for people from all the rest of the world now. But in the EU, yeah. we have an equal partnership. Yeah. And I celebrate the free movement of Don't, people in the mm, EU. Just let me get back yeah. to some of the, the politics of this, because um, um, it, perhaps it shouldn't be this case. Perhaps it's a paradox that it's this case. But the worse um, Cameron does, um, the better the case of uh, Natalie and people who support her kind of position, which is a kind of social Europe position, is going to be in the referendum. If Cameron had come mm. back with a really nasty series of revisions, it would have actually made it more difficult for, her, for Natalie's wing of the... Uh, of it's the interesting. I mean, I, I, I find Natalie's position a, a slightly odd one. Uh, you know, here is, by any definition, an undemocratic and elitist project, a corporatist racket, one where... The power of big lobby groups is elevated over that of private citizens, where we are obliged to pay more to wealthy French farmers than to poor African farmers, where we see Eurocrats touring Europe in private jets and telling, you know, classroom assistants in, in Greece and Italy that they could do with a bit more austerity. How did people from the democratic left end up on the same side as this racket. I mean, I just find it utterly bewildering that you don't think we can do better. Well, I'd agree with lots of your description about problems in our society in terms of the influence of big business, in terms of failures of our democratic structures. And those descriptions apply perfectly well as much to Westminster, our failed first-past-the-post so, electoral system, the influence of big oil and gas companies as we're seeing with the so, government's fracking policy. So that doesn't mean that we want to get rid of Westminster Parliament or we want to get rid of democracy. We want to reform them. So we want to reform Westminster and we want to reform Brussels. And the fact is we need to work together. We have shared problems across Europe. We need to work together on those problems and we'll flourish we best when we work let together. Let me just... Let me just... The idea let me of just, having a European yeah, fortress that's... Any minute now you'll be in the NUJ, but uh, <laughs> uh, until you are, I'll just do the questioning. Um, how is it that the reform is going to take place? Because I mean, I think this is the elephant in the room, isn't it? That people understand that you would like it to be better than it is. 
Um, but they say, look at it, it's a huge monolithic bureaucracy, its democratic element is minuscule to the point of invisibility, it's actually moving in a neoliberal direction, not in a social Europe direction anyway. It's good, good idea, but it ain't going to happen. But that neoliberal direction, of course, comes from the nature of our politics, which has dominated for the past couple of decades across much of Europe and indeed uh, through, through Britain, through successive governments. So what we need to do is change the politics, elect different people to be members of the European Parliament, strengthen the power of the Parliament, just as we need to change the electoral system in Westminster, get a fair electoral system, take away you know, the, the influence of neoliberal, say we're not going to allow the lobbyists to dominate in terms of our political policies. We need to do that in Westminster, we need to do it in Europe. That's a whole political change which, which has to come. And you know, if you look at the, over since we're at the end of the year, look back over the year, we saw the election of Jerry Corbyn as, as Labour leader, we saw the Green Party get 1.1 million votes in the general election, we saw the SNP position to the left sweep aside a right-wing Labour in Scotland. Politics has changed a lot in 2015 and we're going to see even more massive changes in 2016, I believe, and those changes, if we change the politics, will impact in Westminster and in Brussels. Mm. Daniel, um, is it your calculation? Because you, I mean, it's I know it's uh, I know it's approaching pantomime season and so forth. But uh, you know, and people will be entertained by seeing you try to get to the left of Natalie Bennett. Uh, <laughs> Jacob Rees-Mogg tried the same thing on the European argument last night on Question Time. Is this a strategy in the sense that you can't rely on a large enough um, kind of natural um, right-wing element in the Tory Party, and you're going to need, if a no vote is to succeed, a very much larger and much more um, radical yeah. opinion in the country. So I don't think this is about being left or right. The objection that I'm making is not a conservative or a socialist or a green or a liberal objection. It's a democratic objection. The reason why these problems of corporatism and cronyism are worse in Brussels than in the national capitals, it's not because Brussels attracts worse people. It's not, I mean, obviously there are some bad people there, there's some bad people everywhere. But the reason it's worse in Brussels is because the distance between government and government is much greater. The institutions are much more remote, and therefore they're much more prone to the kind of secret lobbying than a democratic national parliament is. You get many more decisions made by people who are invulnerable to the ballot box. Supreme power is wielded in Brussels by 28 commissioners who combine legislative and executive power and are not answerable to anyone. This is a lobbyist's paradise. And I don't think that pointing out that you have a sort of cartel of these big banks and mega corporations running things in their interests rather than that of the ordinary citizen. I don't think that's a left or a right wing argument. That's a basic argument mm. about democratic accountability. Well, if we think about democracy across Europe, we think about the fact that there were 250,000 people on the streets of Berlin campaigning against the proposed EU-US free trade deal known as, as TTIP. They're people who are our allies. We have people across Europe who are campaigning to maintain our standards in terms of environmental standards, food health standards, workers' rights standards. When we work together, we can be far more powerful than we can alone in Britain. And by contrast, if you look at you know, what, the, what our British government has been doing versus what's been happening in the EU, David Cameron actually used British taxpayers' money to try to stop a cap on bankers' bonuses. Europe was imposing the cap. David Cameron tried his utmost with our money to stop it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you raised the question of TTIP before I did. Um, but it isn't part of the problem with your position that TTIP is going to get absolutely enshrined in the current uh, in the current EU. I mean, all they ha all they've done really is they've taken carbon paper and copied it over into into what the EU is going to do. Uh, lots of people campaigning against TTIP think that no would be a sensible position to take given that situation? Well, I think that the, any sort of argument that uh, a vote against TTIP requires a, a vote to leave the EU simply doesn't stack up because under re recent governments, Labour or Tory, under the government we're likely to have for the next couple of years, a uh, Tory government, they would be signing an equivalent between the UK and the US in a flash. We would already be in a TTIP equivalent if we weren't in the EU. So what we have is a chance to build that alliance right across Europe. We saw three million people across Europe, a sign of the growing democracy across Europe, three million people signed a petition against TTIP. So we've got you know, that real force. It's a case of people coming together, working together for the common good. And that happens, you know, democracy at a grassroots level can be very powerful. Daniel, what, what do you make of the uh, divisions now within uh, within UKIP? Because I guess if we were looking from, say, six months before the general election and looking forward to the referendum then, we would have said that Farage and UKIP were going to play a central role in the, in the no campaign. Uh, they seem to have gone into eclipse, if not into mm. uh, internal meltdown. Well, look, I don't think either side 
in this referendum is going to be defined by any party. The, the whole reason, in a sense, that we're having the referendum is because the EU issue cuts horizontally across the parties. It divides the parties internally. It divides my party, divides Natalie's party, divides Labour and so on. And, you know, you can't win, to state a really obvious point. Neither side can win unless it wins on the left, in the centre and on the right. And so you're going to have, if you like, uh, campaigns that are above that. And I don't think that the basic case against the EU is a partisan one. I don't think it's a Labour or a Conservative case. It's, it's simply that, that the EU is the world's only trade organisation that isn't growing at all. Uh, all the growth is happening on other continents. We can't trade freely with Australia or with China or with India. You know, that's only done by Brussels. Brussels, because it's controlled by this racket and this, this uh, cartel, is in no hurry uh, to, to have trade agreements that would suit the ordinary consumer rather than the big corporations. And at the same time, we're paying £350 million a week to belong. And here's an extraordinary fact that I, I just think ought to come out much more. In the last parliament, all the austerity measures put together came to less than half of what we handed to the EU, £82 billion over the last parliament. So all of the protests that people were making against all the austerity measures across the whole of government spending, right, that was wiped out more than twice over. Now, again, I don't think that's a left-wing or a right-wing argument. I just think there must be better ways of spending our money. You could build a brand new, fully equipped NHS hospital every week, or you could give the whole country a two-thirds rebate on their council tax, or you could fund, find some combination of the two instead of funding the lifestyles of these Eurocrats. We're, 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 deep, we're deep in fiction here because, of course, what that discounts is, is what we get back from Europe. And yeah. you know, I'd invite you to go and visit uh, Newport in Wales or somewhere and see, you know, particularly in poorer parts of Britain, how much we've got back when, in when terms of funding. Do you for project funding for, for, all those things, for, for, for all of those things, for all, all of those things that we get back, that we benefit from. Indeed, you know, the students who are on Erasmus scholarships, all of the things. You know, the net is where you have to count. Okay. But I do actually want to. I still, I do want to pick you up on a particular point, which is about in terms of the Green Party. Now, policy in the Green Party is made by the members. We're an intensely democratic party, and we had a motion to the last conference on this, and support for calling for a strong campaign to remain in the EU had 95% support on conference floor. Like any party, we have individual members who have different views, but the Green Party is very strongly united behind the view that we should remain in Europe, work together to solve our common problems. Well, it's good to see that some party is. But um, Daniel, d let's talk about that a little bit, because does it worry you that, um, that if you're successful, if there's a no vote, um, Cameron's toast, isn't he? I mean, the issue of the, the aspect of politics that has interested me least in the 16 years that I've been doing this is about, well, is this good for this individual and does it help the... You know, I, this is so much bigger than who happens to be prime minister or who happens to be a party leader. This is about whether we are a self-governing country living under our own laws, able to hire and fire the people who pass those laws, or whether we are part of a big bureaucratic entity run by people that nobody has elected, where supreme power is wielded, by people who are invulnerable to the ballot box. This is an issue that's finally being put after more than 40 years. And frankly, in terms of you know, who gets to be leader of the Tory party next, or does the current guy get it? You know, all of that is secondary to the basic democratic case. For well, so Natalie, let me ask you the same question though, because uh, are you uh, as indifferent? Um, are you on the same high moral plane as Daniel and that you couldn't care less whether Cameron continues to put austerity through in this country? Well, what I really care about is that we get rid of this Tory government. Um, you know, so we wouldn't, cannot, that, we so cannot, wouldn't we, that put you in the no count then? We cannot last until 2020. And they only have a majority of 12, a thin majority that we've already seen dissolving a number of things. They had to wait until they were sure that a significant number of Labour MPs would vote for bombing Syria before David Cameron called the vote. Um, they only got support of 24% of eligible voters in Britain. So, you know, I have a phrase, 2020 is too far away. We need to get rid of David Cameron, the Tories, so, as so fast why, as possible. So why not be in the no-camp? Because that might uh, be well, the quickest well, way well, of doing it. But, but what we don't do, is, do is, is throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's change our politics, as I was saying before. We need a different kind of politics that works for the common good, not just for the few. We need to actually see a fair electoral system where people know that their votes will count. We need to see that... We need to see that democratisation in Westminster and we need to see that democratisation happening in Brussels okay. as well. Daniel, this is the question which, which everybody in the No campaign has to, has to answer, so let me not uh, let you off the hook here. Outside of some trade bloc or other, and the world is composed of trade blocs really in, in essence, um, how is a small island off the northwest coast of Europe going to do? 
well, we're not a small island by any definition. Well, geographically. Well, <laughs> geographically. Well, are we? I mean, how many islands are there in the world? How many million islands? How many are bigger well, than us? Madagascar, Borneo, we're the ninth <laughs> largest island. So okay. even in a literal sense, okay. we are not a small island, certainly not in terms of population, in terms of, uh, 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 of economy. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. We are, of we're course, one of five percent of the European population. Right, so that's pretty large then, right? We're, but, 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 or, I, I, I'm sorry I introduced the geographical <laughs> element into it. Uh, you don't know, I have no idea how sorry. But anyway, all right, it's the fifth largest economy in the world. How is it going to survive outside um, trade well, blocks? Okay. Well, even the largest economy in the world doesn't. Well, I'm not, no one is suggesting that we would walk away from a European market. There is a common uh, tariff-free area right across the European continent. It stretches from non-EU Iceland across to non-EU Turkey. There are no trade barriers within that 40 or 45 member free trade area. The only countries in Europe that are not part of that common market are Belarus and Russia, because Ukraine and Moldova have now been brought into it. Belarus and Russia have chosen to join a, a Eurasian union of their own. So I have never heard anyone in Brussels suggest, ever, that if Britain left the political institutions of the EU, the uh, European arrest warrant and the common foreign policy and so on, that we would be thereby excluding ourselves from that tariff-free zone. What we would be free to do is to rejoin the rest of the world. And to repeat, it's the rest of the world that's growing. It, it, the Eurozone economy, incredibly, is the same size now that it was in 2008, whereas there's been huge growth in North America, South America, Africa, Asia. And yet we can't sign a bilateral agreement to trade with Pakistan or India or Bangladesh or Australia or New Zealand or our, our, our former African Commonwealth friends or Caribbean, none of that. How did it ever make sense? to abandon a genuinely diverse global market that had commodity producing countries, agrarian countries, industrial, financial, services based, and join a regional customs union, especially in this day and age when the internet has abolished distance and okay. when it makes no sense to be defined by our geography. Okay, we're just running a bit short of time, but I want to get uh, a last question into Natalie, which is mm -hmm. the question which I think that all the pro-Europeans have to answer, mm -hmm. and that is, okay, you like the bits about uh, of social Europe, you like the, you know, the European and you like the social legislation, but all that has been and has had to be passed in to English law. So it's there anyway. So why not take what you've got and also get rid of the anti-democratic elements which you both agree are there in Europe? Well, I think what we'd take on the point that Daniel was raising there in terms of trade, you know, if we want to continue to trade, to continue to have close links with the rest of Europe, they're going to continue to make the rules on their own terms and we will have no option but to continue to comply with them. So we lose the democratic input, the democratic control that we actually have now and which we want to enhance and develop. Uh, and, and we get left having to sign up anyway but having no say in how the rules are made. So what we want to do is get together, agree and make decisions at the right kind of level. You know, it makes sense to make decisions about standards of air quality and water quality that impacts right across the continent at a European level, just as at a global level, as we just did in the Paris Climate Talks. It makes sense to make decisions about carbon emissions at a global level. Let's make decisions at the right kind of level. You know, we have subsidiarity, localism is written into the Lisbon Treaty. That needs to be much more developed, just as indeed we need much more devolving of power within Britain, not focused in Westminster, but devolved out to individual communities. That's the way we need to go, and that's a direction that happens right across the UK, right across Europe. Natalie Bennett, leader of the Green Party. Daniel Hannan from the Conservatives, thanks very much for coming in and leading us through those items.